Hi, welcome back to Central Line. I'm your host, Dr. Katie Berlin, and I have a very special guest with us here today, Dr. Cynthia Otto. Welcome to Central Line. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, thanks for having me, Katie. Dr. Otto, before we get started, would you mind just giving our listeners a brief uh, overview of who you are and what you do? Sure, sure. So I am a veterinarian. I started my career as an emergency and critical care veterinarian and a researcher. Uh, I have transitioned to the director of the Penn Vet Working Dog Center and a sports medicine veterinarian and still a researcher because everything I do is about research and education for working dogs. Love that. And it's it's such an unusual thing to hear. Like we just don't walk around every day and come into contact with people who work with working dogs. So there's so many questions that I have. And I know a lot of people just really love to hear the stories about the dogs and the people that you meet. But um, can I ask how you got involved with working dogs in the first place? Sure. It's um, a long story, but we can make it really short. When I was doing my residency down at the University of Georgia, I tended to be the one that was very much emergency oriented and, and kind of outdoors active, interested in all sorts of things. And when the phone call came in saying that they needed some veterinary support for one of the search and rescue teams locally, they handed that to me. And so I called the team and we ended up actually never even connecting. But when I moved back to Pennsylvania, to the University of Pennsylvania, I was so intrigued by this concept of search and rescue dogs. It's like, wow, what do they do? And how can I help? And how does my emergency medicine training, you know, play into that? Uh, so that I eventually joined the Pennsylvania Task Force, which is one of the FEMA urban search and rescue um, teams. And I joined as a veterinarian. I did not actually have a dog and I was there to care for the dogs. Ended up uh, responding to Hurricane Floyd and then to 9-11 and Certainly my time at 9-11 was sort of the merging of all of my interests of, of emergency medicine, research, these amazing dogs. And we launched the uh, longitudinal study of the dogs that worked at 9-11 that was funded by the AKC Canine Health Foundation. And that just opened the doors, opened the floodgates, and opened my heart um, to these dogs because there's just nothing better and to be able to support these dogs to be able to continue research in ways that these dogs can continue to uh, perform and excel and be healthy and be you know happy because these dogs love what they do and we want to make sure they do it um, in a safe and, and really good environment. I love that you said that, that they love what they do. You know, that's all we can ask from, that's the most we can ask from work, right? Is that something we're passionate about and love doing every day. And, and it seems like that's the image too I get, you know, when I see pictures and video and interviews, of people who work with working dogs, that they just can't wait to get out there and do what they're trained to do. And it's just a beautiful thing. Um, so I can imagine that you see a lot of pretty amazing things in your work. We are here today talking in large part because um, you were the chair of the task force for the 2021 AHA Working Assistance and Therapy Dog Guidelines um, that came out last fall, uh, which is really exciting because this was really the first um, guidelines of its kind, right? Were there Are there any other um, you know pieces of work that sort of come together and consolidate those recommendations for people who care for this kind of dog? So I think that it has started to really creep into our our literature a little bit more about working dogs, but these guidelines are absolutely the first thing that, that have really come out uh, with these kind of uh, clear recommendations and also the, the group that we pulled together to participate in this was incredibly talented and you know brought the experience across all of the different types of working dogs so there there are a couple of other i believe there's a vet clinics of north america there's a couple books now that are, are starting to address working dogs but this these aha guidelines are are really sort of the across the board and really directed at at any veterinarian or any veterinary program or professional that works with these dogs just to, to really start to open the door and answer some of those those important questions of how do we best care for these dogs. Yeah, very exciting. And something that, like when I was reading through the guidelines, I don't 
you know, I was in practice till about five minutes ago. <laughs> and I don't, I don't see very many working dogs in my line of work, you know, here I'm in central Pennsylvania, you know, and um, our clinic just didn't seem to get a lot of those patients. Um, and so it had been a while uh, back when I worked in New York, I worked on some border patrol dogs, which were very, um, it was kind of terrifying yes, to me yes. and I wish I'd had these guidelines <laughs> then because they I mean these dogs are just so impressive but the thing that really struck me was how bonded they were to their handlers I mean it was like you could see the bond in the air between them it was like a tension where they I felt safe as long as they were looking at their handler and their handler <laughs> was looking at them and um and you could feel that bond coming out of the pages of these guidelines of just like how important it is to take that relationship into consideration whether it's a working dog or an assistance dog um and i really love seeing the different ways that the human animal bond can show up and um this was a really special read so I would encourage people, even if they don't work on working dogs very often, to take a look at these guidelines because I feel like there's definitely um, there's a lot we can learn from these. Can you talk about some of the unique challenges and differences in caring for working dogs um, apart from you know the dogs we see in general? Sure, practice? sure. And I, I think what's really important is to recognize kind of what we mean by working dogs too. So mm -hmm. we, we need to think about the different categories. Uh, we have our assistants and our service dogs. Um, and I think those we, we pretty much are familiar with our guide dogs, but there's so many other service and assistance dogs. Uh, and again, these dogs have an incredible relationship with their handlers. They, they depend on each other uh, mm -hmm. in just such a way. We also have what we would call our, our law enforcement or patrol dogs. Most of these dogs that we think of in the patrol field, this would also include our military working dogs, are dogs that do protection type of work. So they would be uh, our, our dogs that would do criminal apprehension, but most of the police dogs are what we call dual purpose, so they also do a scent detection task. Mm. So we might have a dog that does explosive detection, but also does criminal apprehension and maybe some tracking as well. So those are another group of dogs. And then we have our single purpose detection dogs, and those might be uh, dogs that strictly do explosive detection. So in the airport, we have dogs that are screening passengers. And, and they may be shepherds, but um, just more commonly, actually, they're probably Labradors or German Shorthair Pointers. And so their job is purely nose-driven to detect that odor. And we have, in the single-purpose realm, we also have our search and rescue dogs. Um, and search and rescue dogs work in a couple of different environments, whether that's a disaster environment, which is the, the types of search and rescue dogs I've spent the most of my time with. And then there's uh, search and rescue dogs that work in more of the, the wide area or wilderness type environments. Um, and so we have that spectrum. And I think across all of those, there is that incredible relationship between the dog and the handler. And it it is truly life-dependent and life-saving. And so as, as veterinarians, particularly if you don't see many of these dogs, um, it's really valuable to, to kind of go through the guidelines and get some, some suggestions as to how these dogs are different and how we do need to think about them differently and, and work in a way that is truly cooperative care, not only cooperative with the dog, but cooperative with the handler. So it is a, a team approach and it is something that that we have uh, really, really strongly recommended is that we work with the handler and the dog as a team and we don't remove the, the handler from the dog. And, you know, certainly with the police dogs and the military working dogs, that's a whole safety issue um, and, yeah, and a I trust. <laughs> I did not want to remove <laughs> no, those dogs. No, please be there and, <laughs> no. and help assist me with that for sure. Yeah. Um, do you feel like, because as listening to you talk about that, I'm thinking about the fear-free movement, you know, and low stress handling and how in the last, like I've been a vet now for, I guess this is, will be 13 years coming up. And in the time since I graduated, the focus has changed so much. You know, my first job were holding dogs down, you know, under a blanket to get oh, blood samples. Yeah. and. Now, you know, we're doing it in the room with the owner and some cheese, you know, and it's a totally different um, approach to animal handling in general. Do you feel like 
that's something that is taken to to more to a higher level with these working dogs, um, and that maybe we could take some of that with us to general practice. I think that this whole movement towards low stress handling, fear free, cooperative care, however you want to mm-hmm. define it, is absolutely essential because what I learned early on in working with these search and rescue dogs and these are Labradors these these are not threatening dogs that I was working with yeah they are like the worst patients they're so (laughs) you know they're they're they have this independent thought they're very smart yeah and if they don't want to do something they don't do it you cannot (laughs) wrestle them and you know with our police dogs you will you do not want to wrestle them um and so really trying to incorporate as much of this low stress cooperative care as possible is really good for us it's good for the dogs and here at the working dog center that's all, that's all we do. I mean, it sometimes takes mm-hmm. us a while to do vaccines on a dog because we're just going to, we're going to take that time. Um, and we use a lot of peanut butter. Um, so yeah. that's, you know, that's really valuable, <laughs> but we, we can have dogs, we've trained them that they just, they will stand and we will take blood from them with, you know, again, minimal crowding. One person, we, we'll mm-hmm. just do a, a very, you know, quick draw and they'll, they'll stand there and they'll look, you know, lick their peanut butter cup. Um, and then they're fine with it. And it's so different on how we interact, but it, it came out of necessity because you just, unless you, mm-hmm. unless you sedate these dogs, you're not going to manhandle them, um, to get them to, to participate in veterinary care. And, once you do that, you know, start manhandling them, it only escalates because they go into defense mode. That can destroy your bond. It can, de- you know, it can interfere with their work. It can interfere with all sorts of different aspects. Absolutely. And I would imagine that in the case, especially of like an assistance dog, that seeing the dog distressed would be potentially very detrimental to their person. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, another thing that, that we have to so think strong. about is if we have a visually impaired handler, then... Mm-hmm. If you're doing things to their dog and the the handler's picking up that the dog is stressed and not knowing. So again, how we communicate during our whole exam and what we're doing and making sure that that handler is is absolutely attuned to what's going on because as the handler gets stressed, stress, the dog gets stressed and the, the dog gets stressed, the handler gets stressed and and then yeah. not only are, are we creating stress, but we're also not able to pick up some of those subtle findings. And what we find, yeah. because these handlers and dogs are so attuned to each other, handlers will bring in a dog and say, you know, there's just something off. <laughs> and you're like, I can't mm-hmm. even see it, let alone figure it out. Um, especially if that yeah. dog is on guard, if it's it's stressed, if it's in... Like, I'm in engaged and active mode. Um, you're not going to pick up the the subtle findings, uh, you know, a pulled muscle or or some something that that is going to impact that dog's performance and that dog's safety and the handler's safety. So we really want to maximize um, that sort of low stress environment to maximize what we're gaining and what we can what we can observe and give back to that dog. Those all seem like really good lessons for people just in practice in general. Yes, yes. I, to listen more uh, than I, I have always, <laughs> I've always used the phrase, I don't want to be a dog whisperer, I want to be a dog listener. Um, and, yeah. and I think there that, you, you know, the more that we listen to these dogs and also acknowledge that the handlers, they may not have the medical knowledge, but they know their dogs. They know yeah. the different things that are going on with their dogs. And so to listen to them and understand that, yes, there's something, you know, even if I have a completely normal CBC in chem and my usual physical exam, which might be a very, you know, quick hands-on, isn't picking it up, there's going to be more subtle things. And now we have to start thinking about from my little sports medicine hat, you know, what about functional movement? What's going on with, with how that dog's performing? You know, are there some subtle things that we really need to kind of dig in on? Because if we do have a pulled muscle, that, that certainly could interfere with that dog's ability to, to function. Yeah, absolutely. I think the lessons we can take from working with animals who are so finely tuned to do a job, but also have people who are so tuned into them, like that seems to be how pet owners are 
now is, you know, these are family members in many cases and listening to the pet owners, keeping them involved in many cases, not separating them. That's how people want you to practice. Well, they want us to practice that way now. Um, and it's becoming an expectation that that kind of transparency and active listening and sort of approaching veterinary care as a team, it seems like that's going to that's becoming the norm and I love that. It's so much more fun to be a team rather than to like stand on the pedestal in your white coat, you know, and like hand down advice. Like that wasn't that doesn't seem that yeah, fun. Yeah, no. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, if we approach it as a team even for people with their pet dogs by engaging in sort of what we call husbandry training or any kind of training, mm. we know that people who work with their dogs, who train their dogs, that actually enhances the human animal bond. And so to me, yeah. you know, we have people who do competition sport with their dogs. And, and I, I used to do that too. And I realized how much that really enhanced my relationship with my dog. We take that and mm-hmm. we take it to this professional level and, and you can just see how that grows. And so it's really something to, to aim for is if we're going to really build our relationships and, and not only with dogs, but with any of our, our companion animals. So the more we listen to them, the more we interact with them, the better our relationship and we can work together with them to and as a veterinary team for their care. I think that that's just universal across the board is something that we can learn from the relationship that these dog handlers have and and hopefully enhance that in, in all of our clients. It's hard to believe, but it's that time of year already. Registration for Connexity 2022 is open. AHA's annual conference will be in Nashville, Tennessee this year from September 14th through 17th, and you do not want to miss it. From workshops to games to unforgettable speakers, we're planning something for everyone on your team. So bring them all and join us for an event that will leave you energized and inspired. Learn more and register at aha.org slash connexity. Let's create a better world together. Uh, you had mentioned sporting dogs and going to events with your dogs. Do you ever get pushback from people in your work with working dogs um, who don't think dogs should be doing this kind of work, that it's putting them in the line, in danger unnecessarily or forcing them to do something they don't want to do? I, you know, I think it's something that we think about. Um, and so, you know, should dogs be doing this? Well, I can tell you that it's actually more harmful to take a dog that is bred for generations to have this kind of intensity and this kind of focus and not allow them to do something. Um, So I think that what we can think about is how do we enhance the safety, the welfare of the dogs in these jobs, but doing these jobs is a hundred percent, uh, valuable and and really good for the dogs and we we actually even have data to support that um the search and rescue dogs that that worked at 9 11 we we studied those dogs and we followed those dogs and we compared their long longevity their diseases everything to a group of search and rescue dogs that didn't respond to 9 11 and what we found is that 9 11 could not be associated with any real ill effects on the dogs that went. And, and we were concerned about that. And we we're like, we need to know if there's a problem so we can change our management practices, our trainings, anything that, that might, you know, be an adverse effect. But we, we actually didn't find that their experience at 9-11 resulted in any kind of systematic behavioral change, any kind of physical uh, abnormalities that weren't across all dogs. So did dogs from 9-11 develop cancer? Absolutely. 30% of them developed cancer, but so did 30% of the dogs that didn't go to 9-11. So we couldn't find an association. But to me, the most amazing information that we gained out of that study following you know, 95 Labradors and Shepherds and other dogs um, that went and 55 that didn't. So 150 search and rescue dogs. When we looked at them as a group, overall, the longevity of those dogs was actually higher than our pet dogs of the same breeds. So when we're dealing with dogs that have jobs, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but, you know, whether it's they're more physically fit, whether that that bond that they have, um, whether the the purpose that, you know, they're not sitting, you know, bored 
bored all the time, um, that they're, they're mentally mm-hmm. and physically active. They lived to about two and a half years longer than, than pet dogs of, of similar breeds. So I think that when we're looking at these dogs, I think it's really important. And, and I think another piece is, as veterinarians, when we help people select the type of dog that's right for their lifestyle, we need to make sure that they understand that if you're going to get a hunting line Labrador, a field, field line Labrador, that is not a dog that is going to be happy sitting on the couch. He's going to eat the couch, uh, but he needs, you know, he needs <laughs> that physical and mental stimulation. Uh, and it's, it's not just, you know, running, uh, chasing a ball is, is not enough. They actually need that mental stimulation um, to, to keep them happy and thriving. And, and so I think that what we're doing for these dogs by providing them all of this, you know, human interaction, uh, this focused work, uh, and, and these dogs they love their work. <laughs> you know, they, they love what they're yeah. doing. They are so excited to, to be able to do this kind of work that I, I think that it is actually a gift that we have to, to have working dogs. Um, but we have to think about how we treat them and make sure that we're enhancing that bond and that we de- develop the science to support these dogs uh, in the best way possible. Mm. I love that answer. You know, that makes you think of a uh, that movie that everybody's putting out memes about now, Dog with Channing Tatum and the Belgian Malinois, and the, everybody's putting out memes because they're really scared of all their clients that are going to come. Oh, in and say, help Belgian us, Malinois. please! <laughs> go out and get help one. Us, <laughs> like it is much crueler, in my opinion, to put a Belgian Malinois in a small apartment with a bunch of kids versus <laughs> versus letting a dog do what what it's bred to do and and naturally is inclined to love. Um, so I I, hope I, I, I fostered one of our <laughs> dogs for are, our program and it was a Belgian Malinois. And I, I definitely... Yeah. They are brilliant dogs, but they dog. are, they're a Ferrari mm-hmm. um, and they absolutely yeah. need a job. Um, that is, uh, yeah. they... They are not pets. <laughs> they are not pets. No, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm thinking of a Malinois I knew who um, had a wonderful owner, but the dog was uh, so fearful in the clinic. And this was really before we were handing out anti-anxiety medications, you know, to everybody the way that the way that I happily do now. But um, he he had a heart murmur. He had pulmonic stenosis that went undiagnosed for a couple of years because people could right. barely get close to him and when they did he was growling and it just you just never got a good auscultation and then suddenly here's this giant murmur like no that yeah. wasn't a growl that was a murmur um and uh thankfully found before he had an issue but it was um you know it was a shock that day um yeah there are a lot of dog a lot of dog um so I wanted to ask you too, you know, in some areas in veterinary medicine, you have people who are taking care of like farm animals or um, draft horses who have to pull a cart, um, Amish horses, you know, um, animals who there's a very clear economic line beyond which they're not going to be saved. You know, the veterinary care is not going to be worth the money um, to that to that owner. And I was just wondering in your work, do you find that most of the organizations you work with are willing to kind of go to that next level to, to pay for medical care for Yeah, I think dogs? that's a great question. And it's a real challenge um, because we have to look at the populations that have, that have these dogs and are working with these dogs. Now, some of the service dog organizations, the organizations maintain ownership of the dogs. And so they're able to make sure that they can provide the care. Um, but for some people who have service dogs, they might have challenges with you know having a job or holding a job and so they might not have the finances to support that but their lives depend on it and so you know how do we support them so that they don't have to make these decisions on a financial basis and i think that's a challenge for us as a veterinary profession and as a community uh, in supporting these people when we look at our, our search and rescue dogs uh, some of those dogs are owned by fire departments but a lot of the search and rescue handlers are volunteers um, and you know, 20 years ago, when I looked at the numbers, people were spending about $15,000 a year just on training and supporting their dogs, and it's coming out of their own wow. pocket. Um, and yeah. so the thing about the search and rescue folks is they will probably, you know, 
not have dinner to, to be able to support the, the care of their dogs. Um, but again, we need to be attentive because these are public servants. I mean, they're doing a service for our community mm-hmm. that would otherwise not be done. And so, you know, there are going to be some situations where it becomes a financial decision whether they can do something or not. Um, but usually they're going to they're going to do everything they can to support that, or they might opt for a less expensive route if there's an alternative. Uh, with our law enforcement agencies, they they have uh, again they have some financial constraints, but a lot of times if that dog reaches a point where there is a major problem that's going to prevent it from working they'll retire the dog and a lot of those dogs will then go to live with the handler but once they're retired the department no longer pays for their care and so the hand is on the handler again Um, luckily there are some charitable organizations that help support uh, these working dogs in these kind of situations but it's it's really difficult because when we look at the the service that these dogs provide um, it, it is something that we need to figure out can we help prevent them from having to make those kind of decisions and and I think that um, you know luckily we don't run into it too often but there are definitely financial situations that come up that that we have to have a conversation about Uh, and I I think probably one of one of the most difficult decisions when we're dealing with working dogs is the question of euthanasia Um, and there's nothing that moves you more than when not only the whole police department, but like all of the neighboring police department canine unions Mm -hmm. uh, units file into your hospital to say goodbye to one of their their colleagues. I mean, they base they these are officers. Um, And, you know, it's just like, it just chokes you the 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 bond is. Yeah, I I choke up even thinking about about some of the the settings when I, I I've had to be in that situation and you know it's not something they take lightly Ugh. at all no no I I'm glad um and I I feel like that must put a lot of pressure on you and colleagues who work on these dogs um you know the think of not just the police dogs that come in with a gunshot wound or something um which we hear about in the news sometimes you know um these dramatic rescues and saves um but also just a you know somebody's assistance dog who's been with them for a decade and they're sick now and they have something that you can't fix i mean what how do you handle that kind yeah. of pressure and i that, mean those it's emotions? it's really tough it it really is and it, it is you know i guess the way i try to think about you know just as having having lost you know a dog that was with me for 17 years is that every day is a gift that i have that dog Um, And the, you know, the opportunity to have been able to experience that and, you know, as part of the team with that handler and that dog to be able to provide the care that we that we know is the very best possible. um, That's that is kind of the the only way we can get through that, because we we know they're all going to die sometime. And if we focus on on that, it's just it it, is just going to rip your heart out every time. Yeah. The most beautiful and also terrible thing I feel like about working with animals is that you know they're not begrudging any of those days or any of the days they're not going to get. They just live in the moment. And oh, the, yeah, that you, to learn from dogs about <laughs> so, joy is you know is definitely a yeah, lesson that we, yeah. we can we can learn from them. Uh, well, Dr. Otto, this has been fantastic. And um, before we wrap up, I just wondered because so much of this, like just thinking about those officers lining up for those dogs do you have any stories about a particular dog or a particular dog and person combo that really touched you or that (laughs) so so many stories so many a million i think one of the ones that that probably you know brings tears to my eyes almost every time is one of the search and rescue dogs uh Brittany, who was the last surviving dog from 911 and she was a golden retriever and her mm. her handler denise corliss um denise came to ground zero as our team was leaving so that was kind of the first time that that i ran across her and and Brittany and you know Brittany was just certified at that time i think either 18 months or two years old and and throughout the years and until she turned 16 um she was actually i think she died about 16 and a half or, or a little bit older um just the relationship 
that that she and and um, that Denise and Brittany had was it was so wonderful. And not only did they serve as search and rescue dogs on a, on Texas's task force, but she went on to be like a reading assistance dog and, and just, you know, just an all around, you know, touch the world dog. Uh, She was, she was really, really amazing. I mean, there's so many dogs that have so many incredible stories and, and it's, and it's that relationship again, you know, the dogs are incredible, but it's the Mm -hmm. team. It's the, their connection um, with people that really puts them into a, in a whole different realm. I love that. I remember reading about Brittany. Yeah, there's a video on, on YouTube. It just, face. you know, it, it yeah. just, you know, she had a sweet 16th birthday, which was a very fun video. And then the oh, video of, of when they finally had to make the decision that it was time to put her down um, was, mm-hmm. you know, again, full, t- full on tearjerker. I can imagine. Well, Dr. Otto, I could ask you questions. <laughs> I could talk about working dogs. <laughs> but... There's just so much to say about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll get to hear more of your story sometime in the future. But thank you so much for spending this time and just talking to us about um, about some of just some of the points from the guidelines about really listening. And I think we can all take that away into our practice, um, whether we're working on working dogs or not. But I really do think these guidelines are a good read for anybody in practice, because we can take those lessons with us. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I, I do think dog. that they're absolutely great you know, across the board. And if people do want to learn more and want to mm-hmm. really kind of hone those skills and build build that up, we, we actually have a, a certificate program that we teach through the Working Dog Center mm-hmm. called um, Working Dog Practitioner. Um, and that allows people to actually take it to that next level. Um, so I think the guidelines are the wonderful introduction. But if, if people want to take on that, you know, more education and really understand um, the the nuances of working with these these incredible dogs. Um, then I would encourage people to look into workingdogpractitioner dot com. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll put that in the show notes so people can just go right to it. That's wonderful. Great. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. Oh, thanks for Dr. having Otto, me, Katie. Thank you it's so been much. Great talking to you. Me too. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. We'll catch you next time on Central Line.